Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. This is John West for ID the Future. The Texas State Board of Education is currently revising the state science standards, including how they teach about evolution. On January 21st, the board held a hearing featuring experts on both sides of the evolution debate. Dr. Stephen Meyer, director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute, was one of the experts invited to testify. Here are his opening comments. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, I'm Steve Meyer of the Discovery Institute. Thank you for inviting me to testify. Uh, Apparently, a number of people have already come up to tell you what I think, uh, so maybe my testimony isn't necessary. But even so, I think you'll find what I actually think a good deal more interesting and credible than what you've been hearing about me and my colleagues uh, secondhand. The issue before you today is remarkably simple. In the past, you've pursued a progressive science education policy. Your standards have encouraged both comprehensive or comprehension of scientific theories and critical thinking about them. You've encouraged your science teachers to teach students to, anal- uh, uh, to analyze, review, and critique scientific theories and explanations by considering their strengths and weaknesses. In the proposed revised standards, the phrasing encouraging such critical thinking has been substantially watered down. The standard C3A in the various subject sections of the proposed TEKS for grades 9 through 12 still encourages teachers to help their students analyze and evaluate scientific explanations. Nevertheless, it no longer encourages teachers to inform students about any specific strengths or weaknesses of those explanations. Yet the current TEKS have had language requiring that, that students learn about strengths and weaknesses for many years. So why the subtraction? Oddly, in the case of evolutionary theory, The terms analyze and evaluate are also absent entirely from the proposed TEKS. Instead, students are supposed to recognize that and identify that. The evidence supports this or that aspect of evolutionary theory, apparently without any critical analysis whatsoever. Standards that once encouraged critical thinking now encourage unqualified affirmation and subtly demand intellectual assent. I know that some of you think that the terms uh, evaluate and analyze will have the same effect as language uh, encouraging re- reviewing strengths and weaknesses. But how can these terms do that if they are not in the evolution standards at all? So this is the issue. Should the TEKS treat evolutionary theory differently than virtually all other scientific subjects in your standards? In other words, should your standards exempt presentations of evolutionary theory from the normal scientific method of critical evaluation and scrutiny to which we would subject any other theory. I've come to recommend that you not teach evolutionary theory in this way. Instead, I would like to recommend that you strengthen your support for the critical thinking uh, provisions and that you do so in three specific ways. First, I'd like to recommend that you retain the strengths and weaknesses language for all subjects, science subjects. Second, I recommend that you add the analyze and evaluate language to the standards covering evolutionary theory. And third, I recommend that in order to protect the academic freedom of your teachers, you specifically add the strengths and weaknesses language uh, to standards that address how teachers should present evolutionary theory. Now, there are several compelling reasons to adopt these recommendations, but before I present them, let me first give you some background information that you may find helpful as you assess the issues at hand. First, let's do a quick review on the key tenets of evolutionary theory. What are we talking about here? The main branch of evolutionary theory, the theory of biological evolution, or modern neo-Darwinism, attempts to explain the origin of new living forms from simpler pre-existing forms of life. There are two main parts of this evolutionary theory. The first historical part asserts that all organisms descended from a single common ancestor in the remote past. This idea, known as universal common descent, paints a picture of the history of life as a great branching tree. Darwin envisioned this tree of life beginning from a few simple one-celled organisms that gradually developed and changed over many generations into new and more complex living forms. The second part of biological evolutionary theory affirms that a mechanism known as natural selection, acting on random variations and mutations, is capable of creating fundamentally new forms of life. 
and that this mechanism is the cause of the major changes that we see in the history as depicted by, by Darwin's famous tree. Neo-Darwinism emphasizes the importance of natural selection acting on random mutations in the genetic information stored in DNA. In addition to biological evolution, there's another branch of evolutionary theory called chemical evolution. Chemical evolutionary theory attempts to explain the origin of the first life from simple non-living chemicals. Biology textbooks typically discuss this theory, although to a lesser extent than they discuss biological evolution. Now, another issue. What do we mean when we say that a theory has a strength or a weakness? Typically, scientists formulate theories to explain evidence or predict new patterns of evidence. So a theory has a weakness when it fails to explain or has difficulty explaining a piece or pattern of evidence. A theory may also be seen to have a weakness if it fails to predict new evidence or if the arguments that scientists have made in its favor are contradicted by new evidence or data. Does evolutionary theory have weaknesses as well as strengths? I come to the debate about the origin and evolution of life from a background in the earth sciences. After college, I worked in Dallas for several years as a geophysicist for the Atlantic Richfield Company, ARCO. Then after receiving a Rotary, a Rotary Fellowship here in Texas to study in England, I completed a PhD in the history and philosophy of science at Cambridge University. I've taught this subject at two different universities. Historians and philosophers of science study how scientists reason and, how, and they examine the logical structure of specific scientific theories and arguments. They also study specific scientific theories that raise, raise larger philosophical questions. Now, by the way, uh, those who say that theories don't have weaknesses are forgetting their history of science. Have you ever heard of phlogiston theory or geocentrism or geosynclinal theory or even Newton's theory of universal gravitation? All these ideas were considered theories in their heyday and are now known to have serious weaknesses. In any case, during my years in Cambridge, I studied the logical structure of Darwin's theory of in the origin of species, and also theories about the origin of the first life. In the course of my research, I discovered that for each evidence-based argument for the theory of evolution, there was an evidence-based counter-argument in the scientific literature. As a result, I've always thought it made perfect sense to teach both strengths and weaknesses of evolutionary theory as well as other theories, and for several key reasons. First, first teaching students to evaluate, critique, analyze, and review strengths and weaknesses of scientific explanations teaches students about the process of science itself. This is what scientists do. They weigh the strengths and weaknesses of proposed theories. They assess the explanatory power and predictive ability of their theories in light of the evidence, old and new. And they often argue about how to interpret the evidence and whether a given theory can explain it. If we do not present scientific theories this way, if we do not discuss how well scientific theories do or do not explain various pieces of evidence, then we're not modeling what scientists themselves actually do. Instead, at that point, we're not really teaching science. We are teaching students to memorize by rote the conclusions of others without any participation in the process of reasoning and evaluation that gave rise to those conclusions. The need to train students to investigate strengths and weaknesses has been recognized by the National Research Council, an arm of the National Academy of Sciences, who recommend, for implementing, who recommend this for implementing the National Science Education Standards, in fact, they say that students should be able to assess both the strengths and weaknesses of various theoretical claims. And I have the whole quote on the screen. By the way, Darwin himself favored this approach to presenting a scientific theory. In The Origin of Species, he used a deliberative scientific method that required him to present both the strengths and weaknesses of his idea. As he wrote, a fair result can only be obtained by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. Now, there's a second reason to adopt this approach. Evolutionary theory, like other scientific theories, has scientific weaknesses as well as strengths. And claims to the contrary simply lack credibility. To confirm this, I'd like to present four binders containing over 100 articles from mainstream science journals, most of them peer-reviewed, each of which presents either a weakness in contemporary evolutionary theory or a weakness in one of the standard arguments that are commonly made in its favor. Um, <clears throat> these papers uh, cover a number of topics. For example, some papers challenge the creative power of natural selection and random mutation as a mechanism for producing major biological change. Some describe difficulties that evolutionary has encountered in explaining the fossil record. Others challenge embryological arguments for universal common descent. Some describe difficulties that common descent has encountered because of conflicting phylogenetic trees. Papers documenting the, some papers are documenting so that so-called junk DNA actually performs numerous functions 
contradicting long-standing Darwinian presumptions and predictions to the contrary. And there are also some papers that critique prominent models of chemical evolution, especially for their inability to explain the origin of biological information, a key unsolved problem that nearly all scientists recognize. Now, many of these papers challenge arguments and lines of evidence that are used in support of evolutionary theory in modern textbooks. They, therefore, have obvious uh, educational relevance. But some of these contain technical material that high school students would find difficult. It doesn't follow, however, that students can't understand many of the current scientific challenges to evolutionary theory. And to demonstrate this, let me just show a few slides about a well-known problem confronting neo-Darwinian theory known as the Cambrian Explosion. The the Cambrian Explosion refers to the geologically sudden appearance of most of the major animal body plans during a roughly 5 million year window, 530 million years ago. During this time, the first representatives of most of the major animal groups, called the phyla, made their first appearance on Earth. And they did so in a a surprisingly non-Darwinian way. According to Darwin's theory, major innovations in biological form should arise gradually as simpler forms of life morph into more complex forms as they slowly acquire new traits via natural selection acting on numerous slight successive variations and mutations. Yet the fossil record shows that new innovations in biological form uh, appear suddenly, uh, and they do so at the same time in the sedimentary record all over the world without any obvious connection to some similar ancestral precursors. If the six billion year history of the Earth were presented Uh, represented as a football field, the Cambrian explosion would have occurred in just eight inches on about the 12-yard line. That's on the yard line where you're moving for the score. Now, this pattern of fossil evidence does not match Darwin's picture of the history of life, or what we would have predicted based on it. If Darwin's picture were true, we would expect to find numerous transitional intermediates, precursors, showing increasing similarity to the Cambrian animals in the transitional, in the strata beneath those that document the explosion. And so we have a clear conflict between evolutionary theory and the data, a weakness that neither classical nor neo-Darwinian theory explains. In the previous slide, the missing fossils are represented in the blue dots there. Moreover, the Cambrian explosion is not only puzzling because of the pattern of fossil evidence, it is also perplexing because the rate at which new biological form and structure arises in the Cambrian defies the capacity of any known mechanism to produce it. No one knows how the genetic information required to build these organisms could have arisen this fast by selection and mutation, and many scientific papers now discuss this problem. Darwin himself acknowledged that the Cambrian explosion posed a valid objection to his theory. And in the 150 years since Darwin, every attempt to resolve this mystery has only deepened the problem. Now, having cited some of these difficulties, it's important to be clear about what those of us on on this side of the argument are, are, are asserting. No one here would dispute that evolutionary theory has many strengths, There are many pieces of evidence that the theory explains well. But clearly, there are also some important weaknesses associated with the theory. And that makes the issue for you as a board very simple. If there are significant scientific challenges to evolutionary theory, and if students can understand some of them, it stands to reason that students should get to learn about them. That's just good biology education. But there's a third reason not to exempt evolutionary theory from the ordinary process of critical scrutiny and evaluation when teaching students about it. If we were to exempt evolutionary theory from such scrutiny, we would ironically be treating the theory as a kind of sacrosanct religious dogma, a belief system that we could not question without fear of ridicule. Unfortunately, as the philosopher of biology Michael Ruse, a staunch Darwinian himself, has noted, some scientists have had a tendency to turn evolution into what he calls a secular religion which may help to explain some of the excess zeal that defenders of the theory sometimes display. Of course, if some scientists want to make the theory of of evolution into a religion or a worldview, that's entirely their prerogative. I have no problem with that. But you as a board are under no obligation to to, uh, to oblige that impulse, to inflict a dogmatic method of presenting this or any other subject on Texas students. Finally, teaching students about the strengths and weaknesses of theories will engage their interest and turns a dry recitation of facts and propositions into an educational adventure. Students care more about the evidence, the scientific evidence, when they know that there is a controversial issue at stake in the discussion of it. Those of you who have been teachers know this. In any case, there's no better way to turn students off from science 
than to tell them that an issue was settled 150 years ago and there's nothing more to discuss, especially if they know that's not the case. And by the way, I know that many of you are concerned to represent your constituents in this as well. And so you might be relieved to know that the best data we have shows that Texas residents overwhelmingly favored this course of action. The last poll taken on this issue by the Zogby poll, the Zogby Corporation in Texas showed that 82% of Texas residents agreed that the State Board of Education should apply the strengths and weaknesses standard in the TEKS to, quote, how evolution is presented in the textbooks. So what are we so afraid of? Why is there so much tension surrounding this issue? I don't really know the answer to that myself, but I do know that allowing... 15 seconds? Can I finish? Yeah, finish, yeah, finish yeah, it Thanks up. very much. Uh, yeah. But I do know that allowing an open discussion of different perspectives of the evidence as opposed to discussing religion on the one hand, or as opposed to shutting the discussion down on the other, is the best way to diffuse the tension because it gives everyone a place in the discussion and keeps the discussion focused in the right place. Plus, it's exciting, it's fun, and it produces well-trained scientists who can think for themselves. You all have a great legacy here in Texas, and I hope you reaffirm your commitment to open inquiry and and adopt science education standards that advance and preserve that ideal. Thank you very much. In our next podcast, we will hear the ending question and answer session with Dr. Meyer. For ID the Future, this is John West. Thanks for listening. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. ID the Future is copyright Discovery Institute 2008. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.